Welcome to the Damcasters, brought to you in association with the Pima Air and Space Museum. I'm your host, Matt Bowen. Well, hello, everybody. And this one is going to be a little bit of a different podcast, mainly because due to my own scheduling and planning and Cyberpunk 2077, we're pushing things a little bit back into January to get things kicked off. We got some fun things coming up. But what I thought I'd do, because we do have quite a few new listeners um, that have come in over the past sort of six months or so, who may not know much about me, why I bang on about typhoons so much. So I thought I'd do a little bit of a ask me anything sort of thing. And we got a few questions in from our fabulous Damcast ears on Patreon, a few of the folks on Twitter, Blue Sky and the like. And we'll just go through some of them and hopefully you'll get to know me a little bit more and also talk about how we put together the podcast. And by when I say we, I mean we, me. Yeah. I wish there was a we. A we would be great. But for the time being, it's just me. So basically we're going to run through a few things. And the, the first thing is, is why I'm doing this here, which is cyberpunk. And the reason I'm bringing that up is it's fantastic. The 2.1 thing with the ray tracing and the path tracing, it looks phenomenal. The story is fantastic, but there's something about it that is even more compelling, which is in the story, you have Keanu Reeves, Johnny Silverhand character, who is sort of in your head. And that's the whole point because there's two consciousness fighting for control of your character's body. So I've got a female V, uh, that's the name of the character, V, um, build, which is Netrunner, all that sort of business. That's how I've set this up and I'm enjoying playing it. But Johnny Silverhand is an unreliable narrator. And the fantastic thing about it is how we self-edit memory and refine our memory over years. So when you play through Johnny's memories, what are you actually seeing? Are you seeing the truth or are you seeing a highly subjective take on what he went through during his time 50 years before you were playing the game now or in 2077 even? And that's important because for history and historians and people who like history, understanding how memory works is vital because we adore the veterans, the, the, the people who have lived experience. But memory is a funny thing. It's a fickle thing. We do it to ourselves. We, we will remember things 100% sure. And the person who has stood next to us will remember it differently for two reasons. One, perspective, life experience, things like that. But also the way their memory is collating it and putting it all together, it's different. And then when you start taking in other people's experiences and other things, your brain jumbles it all around. And that is fascinating. That is not aviation, but it is history related. And that's why we need to always be skeptical about things and skeptical in the best sort of way, not the nasty way, but to sort of dig into it. Um, and that's why I'm enjoying cyberpunk because it's a very, very compelling sort of look at that. Now, what we have going on is lots of stuff in, in January. If you are not already a fantastic damn Castier, you can join now. And all through January, we are doing key rings, ladies and gentlemen. Aren't they fantastic? So if you join up, you will get one of those along with the usual stickers and things. And that will run till the end of the month. I'll be getting those out. I'm hoping to get some more postcards from the fantastic Mark Waters over at Aircraft, who does the the, the airplane imageries. He's got a fantastic new one for the new um, Tempest Grand Peacock's new aircraft. So check that out at aircraft.co.uk, extra F in there. Do have a look at the, the Patreon because we've got some really cool stuff coming up on that. We're going to start doing some Zoom socials. First one's going to be kicking off in February, hopefully just before my trip back out to the Pima Air and Space Museum. I'm going to try to get Scott and Andrew from the museum there so we can talk things and maybe plan in some stuff that the Damcast ears want to see and hear from me. They may not be full episodes. There might be little, little video clips where we have a look at something at the museum and share it for them. So patreon.com forward slash the Damcasters. And check it out. It's just £3 a month plus VAT at the lowest tier. We've also got the Discord as well, which we're opening up. And 
basically when this goes live, we'll be sharing it out. So basically a place to chat about aviation and space and things in a sort of safe environment away from some of the snark. And we hope to keep it that way for a while. So the link will be in the description below and come and join us. It's, it's pretty quiet at the moment. It's mostly me just trying to get some conversations up so that when word gets out, if you want to drop in, have a chat. We've also got a new sponsor and that is the fantastic 909 Apparel. If you've seen me in the real world, you will know that I love a great aviation theme t-shirt and hoodie. Yet finding decent quality ones has been more of a difficult process than I would have hoped for. That is, of course, until I found the Fab 909 Apparel. Named after the famed B-17 Flying Fortress, which flew 140 missions without losing a crew member, 909 Apparel's design celebrates the history and heritage of aviation, which is something I can totally get behind. Each design can take up to three months of research to complete, so that you know that your passion for aviation is matched by the team at 909. And the great thing is you can get your 909 Apparel t-shirt or hoodie just about wherever you are watching this, all through their Amazon shops. So do check out their link tree below to find your local store and get your aviation on. And yes, they do Spitfire ones as well. Check out the link in the description below. Even if you don't want a Spitfire t-shirt, do go check them out. Tom does some great work over there and it's really exciting to have them on board. So links are in the description below. Get cracking. Now, for this episode, we're going to break it up into getting this few questions about me out of the way and then delve into podcasty stuff, how I make it, how we research it, all that good stuff. And then we're going to talk typhoons because, you know, I think that's why most people are here. So the first question um, comes from Patreon, the fantastic Jamie McTrusty, who does incredible work sharing just about everything I post. He's, he's, he's nuts for doing that. But his question is, why and how did the aviation bug first bite you? And that's quite simple. It's my uncle David. He was a pilot, pirate pilot, lived out in Saskatchewan, which is sort of the big flat bit in the middle of Canada. And he'd fly into Calgary to visit me, my grandparents, me, my parents, grandparents, and take me up in his plane. And it was um, Cessna at the time, um, no, a Piper. And then later on, he had a Blanca Super Viking, which was phenomenal, plywood rocket. And that was it. I was hooked. Yeah, you know, my, my grandfather was um, financial director or something like that for versatile tractors back in the day. So my route could have been airplanes or tractors. Fine run thing. Tractors are fantastic, especially the stuff versatile did with articulated four wheel drive and things before they got bought out by New Holland, I want to say. Don't think it was John Deere. Google it. And that was it, really. I was away. And, you know, we'd go to museums, my dad and, and Papa and I, and it, that sort of went from there. And fly past. You know, in Canada, we get them three months late, two, three months late. And that was the bug. So reading all that through the 80s um, helped me as a kid to, to, to read more. Um, I was usually looking at the pictures and cutting out my favorites and putting them in scrapbooks and things. But that, that was kind of the bug. And it just sort of grew fr fr from there. I always wanted to be a pilot, um, could never really afford it. Um, thanks to the, the crash in the early 90s and Canary Wharf going bust and all that good stuff that affected our family. But I sort of found it a route into two operations, which sort of leads into another sort of questions from a couple of our damn casters about sort of what I do and you know how how this all comes about and things like that, which is um, from the fantastic Joe Wilding, who was on the show, oh goodness, about a year ago now, talking about future aviation, future power sources. Go check those episodes out. He's one of our damn casters, and so is Josh Wardman as well. And they just sort of said a bit about me, what's the day job, really? So I am by trade a business analyst. The gag is what we do is we get paid to ask people why. Why do you want this? Why do you say that? And it is a really fun job. And you know, I work in IT for a company called RX um, who do exhibitions and things like that. So basically um, Star Wars Celebration, New York Comic Con, um, all those sorts of things are us essentially. I work on the business side, so we do the big trade shows. 
and those bits I've worked on their registration systems I'm now marketing and sales so what a business analyst does is he builds relationships he or she of course or they um, builds the relationship between the stakeholder and then the provider of whatever systems gathers people's requirements and then articulates them in a way that is communicable um, can't say the word but it's what I do and you build solutions out of the back of that whether that is process refinement business change or technology it's all through conversation which we'll come back to in the podcasty bit because that's kind of where a lot of the rapport building research and the like comes to but before that I was lucky enough to find an airline studies course at East Surrey College back in the day when I finished high school here in the UK so when I was 16 did a couple of years at college and it was great. It was finally doing something I actually loved. And my parents coming to, <laughs> my parents coming to um, uh, parents evening were actually saying, no, um, this kid that you're saying is engaged and wanting to learn, our son is Matt Bone. And they were like, no, no, this is really him. So when I, when I finished that, um, one of my lecturers took me aside and said that service air at Gatwick were wanting dispatchers would I be interested? And dispatcher is one of the best jobs on the airport. You basically load the aircraft, ensure it's fueled properly, do all the turnaround stuff, hand the paperwork over to the pilots, and they go off and have all the fun. And you do it again. And the pre prerequisite for that was three months doing check-in, and then you take the exam, which I aced, and they turned around to me and said they didn't want an 18-year-old dispatcher running around the airport, which was crud. Um, but check-in was great for me. Worked for an airline called Britannia, which I think is now Thomas Cook, or was bought up by Thomas Cook, and it was a charter airline. It was a lot of fun. Ski season was terrible because people who ski are, yeah, you know, the worst. And my wife's gone to the gym and she skis, so we'll let that one go. Sorry if you're listening, darling. Um. And then after that, I ended up for 10 years at one of the most fantastic places, an airline called GB Airways. It's the old Gibraltar Airways, part of the Bland Group, run by the Gajero family. I joined, it was a few 737-300s and 400s. By the time I left, we had a whole fleet of Airbuses, and EasyJet paid massively over the odds for us, and that was the end of it, and I, I moved on. But those 10 years um, working in ops were phenomenal and you know i'd just been promoted to officer which meant i did all the jobs in the role in the um in the office walking up towards a duty manager executive we called it and you know 9 11 happened um i was down in portugal at the time on holidays and the game changed it, it was a lot less fun the fun level was still very high let's not get it wrong but it was it was a bit different and i'm hoping to have a couple of our old gb pilots on um Mel A. Summers and Naomi Barnett in the near future once we can get things sorted out. Talk about the old days and sort of that weird world they entered as female pilots in, in the in the late 90s in an airline that was very male. Um, our ops room was not the nicest of places some of the time. Not proud of some of those conversations. Um, but, you know, it was the, the time and what are you going to do? Thankfully, I think I've grown up and out of it. We'll see. So that was it. After that, um, the company that produced our systems was called Sabre. I got snapped up by them, spent five years traveling, troubleshooting, becoming a business analyst with them, then to Amadeus, which was one of their competitors, worked on check-in systems, um, frequent flyer stuff. So if you've ever wondered how frequent flyer stuff gets you upgraded, ask me, and I won't be able to tell you because it's all mad. Then another four years working for Heathrow in their futures and um, technology area, which was interesting, fun. Again, a very weird place to work before ending up doing what I'm doing. So I got to spend 20 years or so of the first part of my working life in the industry I loved and watched it completely change. Um, personally, I think aviation and civil aviation is really, really interesting and exciting and there's incredible stuff happening in the space. But at the same time, there's a race to the bottom when it comes to service. Uh, and that's down to cost pressures and our expectations as passengers 
um, and the the influence of the low cost outfits, and that is the market capitalism, all that stuff. But it's changed the game, and you have your legacy carriers like BA who are change adverse until it's basically forced upon them, and then you have the sort of more nimble air, airlines at the other end. You know, people like um, Nordic uh, or Norse, even sorry, who are trying to be disruptors. Um, Norwegian tried for a long time as well um, and have had to scale back. There are incredibly interesting things happening in the civil space, which is what I want to do more on the podcast, um, which we're going to get to talk about now, because I've been looking back through the episodes. We do a lot about war and Second World War stuff, which is it's interesting. It's where it's a passion, but it gets a bit much because if you're reading about it all the time, some people love it and can't get enough of it. I tend to just spend a lot of time thinking about death and destruction and how things like the typhoon and spitfire and stuff are killing machines. I try to keep that in mind when I read these things. You know, I look over here, I've got my sort of 20th century bookshelves and yeah, it, it's really good books, grim subject matter. And that's one of the things that I've tried to bring across in the pod, um, which takes me back to, to Jamie's next question, which was why the dam casters? Now, I'm not sure what he meant. Why is a big one. And I ask that question a lot. It's an open question and it's a pain in the ass question. So thank you for that, mate. That was good. But we're going to break that in two. So first part, we're going to say the name, where that came from. And the second bit is why, why I do it. So the first bit, the name, quite simply, um, I had the great, great fortune of being asked by Alex Churchill, who's a fantastic historian. You've probably seen it on the TV and around to join um, the History Hack podcast after I left the Typhoon Project here in the UK. Um, we're not going to talk too much about that because I can't support the project in, in any way, shape or form at the moment. The Canadians, the Typhoon Legacy with JP843, I will talk about that to the cows come home. They're doing some great stuff. Ian is leading that project brilliantly and I've been happy to write articles for them for Airplane and things like that. So check out, check out them. Um, and also check out the RB396 project should you want to. Um, I, in good conscience, can't recommend them. So I left that. I was a bit of a loose end. I'd been a guest on History Hack talking about the typhoon. And they said, well, Alex said, well, do you want to do a Second World War air power pod once a month? And I thought, yeah, sure. Why not? And then she basically, she got me in. She's like, well, can you help us out on the main draw, join the down the pub get togethers? And it was, it was great fun. And it was an incredible amount of work. You know, I think when I joined, it was still daily or something. I remember being able to get down to three days a week, plus my show. That was fab. I managed to get out a lot of that. But you know, taking a day off work and recording five podcasts or more um, was an incredible achievement. And that Alex and Alina and Zach White, who does the fantastic... Um, Napoleonic Wars podcast, The Old Napoleonicist, an incredible achievement. And they're, some of the stuff that they did, the, the whole Band of Brothers um, cast reunion, which is why I've been trying to do some of those myself, the sharp stuff, along with just really, really good, interesting interviews with a lot of people. And it was fantastic. But I fancied branching out, doing more aviation things. And one thing led to another, and I decided to, to go out on my own and... The hardest part of podcasting is coming up with a name. And that's where I turned to the fantastic AV Geeks group chat, which at the time was myself, Adam Barry, and Matt Willis. We now have James in it. We'll have to get some other people in it as well. Um, and for the longest time, as in longest as in a week, the name was Flaming Onions, which was the, the slang term for the tracer in anti-aircraft fire. I quite liked it. It had a nice sort of logo all worked out. And... Um, we were coming up to, this was what? Goodness, when did we start this? It was the summer of 2022. So we were thinking about what was happening in 2023. I was jokingly saying I wasn't going to do anniversary shows. How could you not do the Dam Busters? And then Matt Willis said, oh, Dam Casters. And it stuck because I could sort of mess around with the 617 badge. And there we go. 
the 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 gag is amongst people who ask is I will never do a damn Busters episode mainly for two reasons I think other people have done it better and also it doesn't interest me movie's great love the movie and hope Peter Jackson pulls his finger out and does it again but you know it's not my thing really I could do an episode on the aftermath that would be interesting um, but not the actual thing I yeah. It just doesn't interest me. So the the rules for this podcast are quite simple. First off, quality control. The guests have to sound great. And by sound great, I mean I will spend a lot of time working with levels and things to try to get the audio quality up as far as I can. Sometimes mine doesn't work great, but as long as I can get the question across audibly, this show is not about me, which is why doing this is very weird. Um, so it's... Anything aviation, if it falls off a rock and gets decent hang time, you can come on the show. And it's really born out of this idea of some of the subjects I was looking at for hedge hopping, which was the, the history hack show, was something in the middle of a Second World War aspect. That story doesn't really sit within those six years. There is all the development in, in the 30s and then the stuff that comes out of it um, in the legacy, and that's what uh, Bill Norton's books about um, development legacy start getting very interesting because things don't really stand still. They don't get boxed together nicely. And I know some other, <laughs> as John Conker beautifully put it, more commercially uh, ac accessible podcasts like to, you know, it's this, we're going to be talking about this year and these things. Yeah, sorry, that's years of things. Battle of Britain. Starts in 1936 when they start developing the doubting system, things like that. All of these things have massive, massive lead times in it. So that was the idea. Next question. Not say that was what we try to do. So basically, if it goes up and can stay up for a reasonable amount of time, like the the monk jumping off the tower that we talked about with <laughs> Ben Skipper, yeah, that's in. We can we need to do a whole episode on that, Ben. You're welcome back. Next one, uh, Joe Wilding again, uh, Damcast here, join us on Patreon. How do you go about doing research for an interview epi slash episode? Your questions are always great. Very kind of you, mate. Thank you for that. And you always seem to have a good grounding on the subject. Well, this comes from the luxury of being able to choose my own stuff. And on History Hack, we would be getting boxes of books. Um, Alex has a lockup that's just full of stuff that people are sending to get interviewed. And when you're going at a pace of five or three episodes a week, um, basically what you have is a turn of things. And it's not being able sometimes to get to the depth of it. So what I try to do is look for books and articles or interviews. Um, and to be fair, that's where Twitter and, and the social medias comes in because you get to find lots of interesting people in it that would come down to it and there has to be a hook there has to be i'd love to ask that person this and that's where it comes from it's what can i get excited about in an interview because that comes across um on the podcast so it's it's really find a subject do a bit of googling around it if it's a book and i tend to like going for books because you can delve into many different aspects for it um, and many different aspects for it, many different aspects w within a book. You can talk about the, the process of the research to get into it. And it's really trying to find what brought the guest to that subject, where our interests cross, and really just get the person to enthuse about what they've found. And that takes time because it's you can we can you can read a book for example let's um take roland white's mosquito now that is easy i could have done that without reading the book really and just go let's talk about the mozzie isn't it great what wouldn't wonder uh, best aircraft of the second world war the swiss army all that stuff all the things i've said in the past it's not what the book's really about you know the book is about the danish resistance the you know the mosquito is almost a co-star. It's a bit of a bait and switch, Roland. Yeah, let's let's be let's be honest here. So let's discuss 
that and the impact of air power within that context. So you try to get past the obvious and never be afraid to ask the stupid question. And we've all been somewhere where you're listening to someone and they go, blah, 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 complicated, 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 blah, 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 questions. And you look around, everyone's going, hmm. And you're sitting there thinking, what the hell was that? And if you put your hand up and go, sorry, what did you mean by that? Did you mean this? And nine times out of 10, the person will go, oh, I mean this. The rumored R.J. Mitchell quote, of, if you can't explain something complex, simply you're talking bollocks, right? So that idea of, well, let's ask a simple question. Can you explain this to me simply so I can guess it? So, you know, Joe, for example, was great at that. I want to get Steve Little on to talk about aerodynamics because he's got a fantastic way of explaining those complicated things. Um, Kit Chapman, the other week with the uh, atomic Ivy Mike test, that sort of thing, explaining the complex simply. Um, I think back to Julia uh, Cook, who came on to talk about Pan Am stewardesses. She had this fantastic way of delving into that whole time. And that's what you're trying to look for. You're trying to target, target's a terrible word, but you're trying to get sort of under the skin of something. And the simplistic questions are usually the best because they can challenge the expert to reframe and basically help educate us all. You know, it's, I'm, I'm lucky I get to read something or chat to someone and then spend 45 minutes to an hour delving into it. You know, if it's Phil Blood, we'll be, goodness, hours, because he's doing the other way around. He's challenging me and hopefully you to listen on that. So it's a process really. It's finding a subject, finding somebody to talk about that subject, then doing the research, reading the book, Googling around it, finding their articles, looking at other interviews. I don't tend to listen to too many other interviews on it because I think that can sometimes um, jade my own approach to it. I think, oh, they've been asked that. They're asked that a lot of times. Think about what might be a slightly different question, or even if it has rephrased the question in, in a way that you hope to guess a different answer. Because the last thing you want is having somebody on who just does the usual 40 minutes and goes off. You want to delve into what that usual 40 minutes is, so see behind the curtain. And then once it's together, edit it up so that it is accessible, it sounds good, um, we're doing the video-y things now as well. So there's it's me putting pictures and, and footage up that's uh, that's available. Um, so that it's it's engaging. And you know, I can be having a lot of fun doing this and it can sound terrible on, on when it goes out. That's not the thing. I want you, dear listener, viewer, whomever you are, to have as much fun as I am putting this together. It's hard work, but it's rewarding work. And... I, I'm hoping you, you enjoy it. Um, Joe also asked, if you could get any guest in the world, either specific person or category role, who would it be? Maybe a top three. This was hard. So I'm going to run through this quick. Uh, any of the Apollo astronauts, please. Thank you very much. Um, Bill Anders, especially, he took the Earthrise photo, which everybody has with the horizon flat. He took it and it, they were on a lateral orbit. Anyways. I would love to chat to Bill Anders. Um, Dave Scott as well, who was commander of Apollo 15, the first man to drive on the moon. And interestingly, there's a new documentary that he's he's produced, which is available online um, today when you get this. Tomorrow, yesterday, maybe. It's out. I'll put the link in the description. I'm really looking forward to having a look at that. I did reach out to Helen Sharman. Um, Helen very kindly said no. And I say very kindly because I had the most fantastic chat with her agent, who's superb. She doesn't do podcasts and things. She does. She has done her own ones and she will. But she wasn't at that time um, up for joining us, which is a shame because I think her story is mind blowing. You know, listening to an advert on a radio to join the Russian space program. Just fantastic. Um and also try, try to get her to chat about the, the issue she had with Christopher Priest over the, the biography. Um, 
who else? Oh, Eileen Collins, of course. Um, first woman to command space shuttle. Incredible um, U.S. Air Force career as well. Um, always welcome on the show. Uh, who else? Oh, Chris Hadfield. Yeah, Canadian in space. Bring it on, brother. Outside of that, oh, of course, that brings, you know, if James Kitely is watching, yes, aerospace rather than aviation history, mate. I, I, I get it. I get it. Celebrity-wise, um, Harrison Ford, Tom Cruise, please. Um, just to chat about planes. I think that would be great. I'd love to ask Tom Cruise about what the tax break for him using his own P-51 in Top Gun was and why Pete Mitchell as a Navy pilot would have an Air Force airplane. Why wasn't it a Corsair? Hell, Hellcat or Bearcat, that would have been cool. Um, other than that, yeah, just recently, chat to the crew of Jail Flight 516. Yeah, what was that 20 minutes like? That would be really interesting. Yeah, that same sort of thing, Sully um, Sullenberger. Um, and of course, Heather Penny, who I still think I have a, a degree of separation from. Now, Heather was uh, one of the F-16 pilots who was scrambled to shoot down United 93 on 9-11. The problem that she had was her weapons weren't armed, so she would have had to ram the aircraft. I don't necessarily want to talk to her about that because her life afterwards has been this passion for aviation. And I'd love to delve into that passion rather than that terrible, terrible day. Um, all time, I made a list. So if we can bring somebody back from the dead, my mum would be nice. But if it's got to be pilots, um, Bessie Coleman, Pancho Barnes, Amy Johnson, Johnny Baldwin, Typhoon Pilot, of course, Jesse Brown, um, and uh, Valentina Tresiskova, the first woman in space. Designers, I'd love to get Sydney Cam and Kelly Johnson in a room with a bottle of scotch, talk to them, and also get RJ Mitchell and Joe Smith in and show them the stupidity around the Spitfire today and just ask them what they think of Spitfire porn um, because I think that would be interesting. Jamie, our fabulous Dam Castier again, asks, what's your favourite interview been so far? They've all been great. Um, I, I think the ones that challenge people are fun. The Phil Blood one on the genocidal intent of Bomber Command and the bombings of Arkin. Yeah, that rankled a few people. And I think a few people turned off, but equally few people turned in as well. So those sorts of things. I think back to the early ones, um, sitting down with um, Elena Lewis from Culver Props, talking about how to make propellers, um, Esther Abe with um, Air Corps Library. Do check them out. They've got some incredible stuff on there. That, that was all really, really cool. Um, any episodes you are less happy about, with yes and i'm not going to tell you which ones because that's my fault i th i know the ones i didn't do the prep to the degree i wanted to and that's on me that's not the guest um if a guest doesn't come off well that's not them that is me that is my questions that's the engagement i've had with them and the conversation we have before we start so basically we'll start recording um, basically, because this this thing is quite intimidating. And one of the things we do not do here is the chatty five minutes. I hate that in a podcast. I don't give a monkey, monkeys even, about what the hosts have been up to. Get to the subject. You know, it's, it's, I, I don't, I don't need to hear about your favorite restaurant and things like that, unless the pod's about your favorite restaurants. Yeah, I, Shut up. Move on. Get on to the guest. On History Hack, we, we, we would do that. There'd usually two of us and a guest. And it could go on far too long. It's get to the point and get the, the interview E comfy. And once you're comfy, just have a chat. So if there's any episodes that sit in my mind as not as good as the others, that's not right. Or, or just ones that, how did Jamie put it? Less happy with. Perfect, Jamie. Um, that's me. And I apologize profusely um, to whichever guests those were. Um, favorite episodes as well. The B-58 one um, with Sonny Holt. That's ruffled some feathers and gone literally nuts, right? So the clip of him talking about the afterburner takeoff where they were up to like 27,000 
feet and 45 seconds or something. I think it was that. That has been watched on Insta alone. Check out our Instagram, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, we're on TikTok as well. Over a million times. One million times. And it's overwhelmingly positive feedback on it. The episode itself has been watched on, on YouTube, like 25, 30. It's raced ahead of James Jeffries blathering on about the Blenheim, which is fantastic. Um, and it's ironic, two of the, the most watched and listened to videos are about two much maligned bomber aircraft. Is there. We're going to take a quick break so that we can get the latest from the Pima Air and Space Museum with Head of Collections, Andrew Bowley. Here we are at the Pima Air and Space Museum with some of our Korean War vintage aircraft. Um, here is our F-86E Sabre, um, which was the preeminent American jet fighter during the Korean conflict. Um, originally, we were flying a lot of straight wing aircraft like the F-84 and, you know, reciprocating engine aircraft still like the Mustang, various other aircraft. Um, when this aircraft made its debut, the MiG-15, which was used by the North Koreans um, with also probably some help from other nations. Um, but it was a game changer, swept wings, had a cannon, and really, you know, overpowered anything with a straight wing. Um, around that time, our F-86 started coming into Korea, which the two aircraft were pretty equally matched. Um, armament aside, you know, the uh, F-86 had 50 calibers, while the MiG had, I believe, 20 millimeter cannons, if I recall correctly, three. Um, so 30 millimeter, I think it was 30. Was it 30 millimeter? Two, two, two 30, 220, something, something like that. Yeah. Okay. Cannon. Not the armaments. They're cannons versus cannons. machine guns, which yeah. has always been a big argument. You know, the Americans were always full in on the 50 cal and the machine gun side of things. Well, a lot of other nations tended to lean towards cannons, you know, so depends who you ask, which is the better air, aerial weapon. But our F-86 is actually a real combat veteran with the 51st fighter interceptor wing. Um, it's a bit of a Franken airplane. The fuselage did come from the, a Korean War veteran. The wings did come from another aircraft, but that was one of those things where we decided to go with obviously the identity of the fuselage, which you know has the more interesting history and has an actual Korean War combat provenance. Um, it could be a little bit of a time too to talk about our curatorial choices with paint schemes. Yes. Usually we always try to paint our aircraft in markings that are historically accurate for that aircraft. This F-86 is an example of this. The markings on the aircraft are based on photographic evidence from the Korean War of this aircraft. Our MiG-15, on the other hand, like most surviving MiGs in a lot of collections, is a Polish MiG. It's not a Korean MiG. But because for this, we decided we wanted to tell the story of the Korean War, so we did paint this aircraft in North Korean markings, where usually we don't do that. Um, we usually always try to paint the aircraft for, uh, you know, the historically accurate markings for that aircraft. But like I said, once in a while when we have another story to tell, we'll uh, make an exception. Also, if we painted all our MiGs, they would all be pretty much in Polish markings instead of uh, representing some of the different um, Warsaw Pact nations like we have. To learn more about what is on display and what events are coming up at the Pima Air and Space Museum in Tucson, Arizona, please do check out their website at www.pimaair.org. And now, back to the show. Right, ladies and gentlemen, it is time. We're going to talk Typhoon. Now, we've been going on for a while, so let's, let's crack on. There's some pretty big questions here. I was wondering if we were going to fill this episode up, and I'm talking a lot. Point of order. I'm going to hate editing this. I don't like listening to my own voice. There we go. So let's get cracking. What do we have? Uh, Chris Canfield, the fab allied armor over on uh, Blue Sky. Joe um, Wilding asked this one as well, which is, was there a particular moment when you felt something click and you became super interested in typhoons? Was it a book, a film clip? It was Hendon. I think I've mentioned this before. It, we moved over here when I was, uh, must have been 11, 12, and we did all the museums the first summer. Um, so you get kicked out of school in June. In Canada, we moved over here just after that. 
So we had a few months before we got our house in, in, in Surrey. We were living up uh, Edgware Roadway. So we did all the museums. We went to Hendon. I was a pig in poo. It was old Hendon, so it still had the Battle of Britain Hall. It was 1990. Um, so it was 50th anniversary of the Battle of Britain. We had the big fly past. Me and my dad went up to the mall. It was nuts. And I remember walking around a corner and having that Jamie moment from Empire of the Sun. So, you know, when the Christian Bale shot in the Sp Spielberg movie, when he goes up and there's the zero and the sparks flying and he touches the propeller. That was me. I did touch an airplane in Hendon which I did mention when, when we were up there and I was chatting to Maggie and she told me not to do it again, so I haven't. But it, I just was blown away by this brute of a thing. It is huge um, for a fighter. And I just couldn't believe it. it was that big, in, you know, the, the radiator in, the radiator under the engine. It blew me away. I didn't know what this thing was. And from all my fly past reading and looking at books, it was Spitfires. You know, that's what you look at, Spitfires, Hurricanes. I remember tracing out of books using my dad's tracing paper, who's an architect, hurricanes and things and having them on my wall. And it was like a hurricane that had been to the gym. You know, it had gone full Arnie. And that was it, I was hooked. My, my aunt and uncle got me the Mosquito Typhoon Tempest at War book that was, that was all together. So the Arthur Reed, Roland Beaumont bits on the Typhoon and Tempest. And that was it, I was hooked. I was reading everything I could get my hands on for it for for years and years and years um and interestingly i didn't read the pilot memoirs for a long long time and it was uh when i got involved with the the typhoon project that i expanded my reading out for that and that's when you start sort of spending all the money to get the chris thomas stuff and that was it really um i still love the aircraft incredibly i think as we're going to get into there's a lot of stuff about it that is misunderstood and the what ifery around it which we're also going to get onto is quite something and i i hope i hope um ian slater and the team continue the the pace they are because they're doing a little crowdfunding thing for the, the cockpit section which is all ready to go they just need a bit of cash to get it over the line and it's not a lot of money that whole aircraft could be done uh for a very reasonable sum now, next question. The fabulously named generic user 258 over on Blue Skype asks, why the car door style access? Was there a specific technical reason to go that way or did the designer just really like cars or something? Well, I think Cam did. But what you get is a simple problem of perspex. And this is something I think someone should really, really look into because interestingly, the perspex that's on Warbirds now isn't right. The Perspex at the time was a very different mix. So it didn't distort as much and things like that. And the stuff that's on Warbirds now is, is that's a whole, whole other conversation. But when you start looking at getting a bit of plastic to curve and not distort, and that's the key, you do not want it to be bending light to the point where you can't see your adversary or your target. That's the trick. Now, on the Spitfire, you famously have the Malcolm Hood, but the Spit's not big. So I'm if I'm sitting here like this, you know, it's about there. When I was in the Hurricane, it's a bit bigger. If you sit in a Mustang, same sort of size. When you get to Typhoon, it is a big beast. So you're talking, what's that? Yay much? A decent sized canopy. And you also have the, the instance where what the Typhoon was designed for, and that was to be a bomber destroyer. So there was a lot of armor behind the pilot. So you have the coffin hood, famously, um, you know, the, the whole thing about not looking behind you, you'll be going too fast. Well, you weren't supposed to be. You were supposed to be shooting down bombers. There wasn't supposed to be fighters around. So how do you get all of this space glazed? Well, you come up with different solutions. And there's a lot of people who do give Cam a lot of stick for the car door things. Look at the contemporary aircraft. So the early Razorback P-47s have essentially that um, early 109 Hawker Hurricane style canopy. It's, it's small glazings. You look at uh, the Mustang, the P-51. Uh, so the Mustang 1, 2 has a ridiculous sort of flappy canopy 
lid thing going on. So having sort of a couple doors, Austin 70s style, but with quite big windows. And, you know, when they started taking the metal off and were reframing and glazing that back, but you actually have quite big bits of perspex there. And over time, as they start cutting down the rear structure, uh, you start getting the semi-bubble and then the full bubble canopy. That's sort of where it is. But your, your issue is a design constraint where you can't go straight from hurricane canopy to the full-blown bubble canopy because the technology is not there. It was getting there. Then the FW190 arrived and they saw that fantastic, uh, I think it's two-piece um, glazed back and we're like yeah we need to accelerate this and you know the the bubble the bubble canopy was flying on the typhoon and the miles that weird miles um aircraft by 43 so that's where another story about the the fantastic ability of the typhoon to be modded comes in um but there we go i hope that's it also look at things like the P-39 Aerocrub and the, the P-63 uh, King Cobra. Same sort of deal with the doors. Um, point of order as well. If you needed to get out of the Typhoon, you could eject the doors that way. Um, so it wasn't it wasn't terrible. And enough pilots got out of them. Uh, of course, 660-odd did not. Nick Adler, my old Typhoon mucker, escapee, trusty like myself has a good one. So we're going to read the whole thing here. The importance of the aircraft, the Typhoon, is often stated with regard to the Normandy invasion. Landings campaign. The French don't like invasion. The invasion was in 1940. <laughs> we know a massive amount of sorties were generated and the damage that these aircraft did to Axis forces. Could the invasion have been carried out without this aircraft type? If so, what would have been used Presumably, multi-engine aircraft like bow fighters and mozzies could carry rockets and bombs have taken up some of the slack. But could we have carried out the op without typhoons? Yes. And I think the, the mozzie and bow fighter question is probably where we're going to be. I've got a bow fighter painting, Phil West calling Starlight, John Cunningham um, shooting down a, a Heinkel at night. That's it. I think where things get a little bit interesting, and I'm going to quote from... Uh, Dan Sharp's ME262 book, which is superb. In one of the meetings with Milch, Herman Goering said, a fighter bomber is a fighter that makes a virtue out of a necessity. And that's all the typhoon is. It's, you know, the, the bastard son of necessity. Now, if the typhoon's that, so is the Spitfire. And hear me out on this, right? So for D-Day, there was 20 total Typhoon squadrons on force in the RAF. 18 of those were in second tactical, and two were held back, 263 and 137 for air defense GB. That's a lot of aircraft. Now, if Typhoon is cancelled in 42-43, that means that industrial effort has to go somewhere else. And we'll, we'll sort of come back to that in a second. But... The thing that the Allies prove is you don't need the best to win. You need good enough, and you need a lot of good enough. And if you start looking at Spitfires, by this point, there's a lot of Mark 9s knocking around, especially LF versions, right? It's not a great fighter bomber, right? It's got short range, crap bomb load. It's a pig on the ground, and there's like 60% fatalities if you crash that thing on the ground. Um... That might not be right. I'll have to dig up the thing. Anyways, your your bomb load is basically 500, 750 pounds, maybe 1,000 if you're lucky, but you get about 100 miles in a nine fully loaded. A Typhoon with 2,000 pounds of ordnance, you can get 250 miles out. Now, that's not every mission. Think about loiter time, cab ranking, um, uh, stooging around looking for targets on interdictions. That 250 miles is a lot. With the spit, you immediately start cutting down your available time over target. So, you know, you had a lot of them. You can start filling the gap with those. Licensed P-47s, maybe? You know, the jug was incredible for the ninth. It's there. Now, my thing here would be, if you cancel Typhoon in late 42, early 43, the famous Beaumont, I went and saved it thing, the Tempest wing, so the Typhoon 2 Mark II wing, which is the, the thin one, six inches cut out of it, 
that was on the drawing board by the middle of 1941. So if in 42 the decision was made early to put the effort into Tempest, what becomes Tempest, you could have Tempest 5 early. Now there's a thought. The Tempest 5 was never used for, or Tempest 2 even, if Bristol pull their finger out of the Centaurus, the Tempest was never used in the ground attack role during the Second World War. Just breaking in quickly during the edit to just clarify that Tempest not being used in the ground attack role during the Second World War. What I mean is it was never armed with rockets and bombs and used as a ground attack aircraft in the way the Typhoon was. So it was a clean aircraft used at low to medium level. It did do interdiction rolls where it would attack with its cannons, but it never fired rockets or dropped bombs. So just clarify. So, you know, don't at me on that. Back to the pod. But it it could have been. So there's a what if for you, Nick. You know, does Hawker pivot and put all their eggs into Tempest? Again, the issue is engines, not enough Centaurus to go around. Napier and English Electric still sorting out the 2A and 2B Sabre. So there's still a lot of aircraft knocking around in purgatory, which leads us to Matt Willis, friend of the pod, been on a couple of times. He's going to be on again soon to discuss the Focke Wolf 200 uh, Condor. And he says, I'll throw one in if I may. I wouldn't hear the end of it if we didn't, Matt. Last year, I wrote a piece for Airplane, March 2023 about the proposals to put Rolls-Royce Griffin engines in Typhoons. The main plan was for the 60 series to go in the Tempest, Typhoon 2 at the time, but there was a side project to install Griffin 2Bs, which is the baby Griffin, in Typhoon 1 airframes. Do you think this would have been worthwhile, and how might it change the Typhoon's war? Now, I went back and read Matt's article, which is great. Do check it out. Link in the description. My thing comes down to what we were just talking about with, with range and ordnance as well, because the baby Griffin has about 500 horsepower less than a Sabre. So I think it's about 1730 and it was 2200 for the, so 1700 for the, the Griffin 2B and 2200 for the Sabre 2A. Now, if you clean up the Typhoon with a Griffin, so you've got better radiators, things like that, that starts negating the power issue, I think as well, um, it would look really good. As you see some of the, the aircraft, especially with the wing-mounted radiators, it, it looks sleek. The thing starts getting interesting is that it's a very thirsty engine. So the, the Spitfire 12 had about 350 mile range, and that's with a clean airframe. Um, that's no ordnance under the wings. Now you've got a big, heavy, draggy Typhoon, big wing, the aircraft weighs a ton. You know, fully armed is about seven ton. It's huge. Now, you put a Griffin 2 in the front of that. You have, I believe, and I haven't done the math, but I would suggest your range goes down and your bomb load, rocket load, would go down as well. But again, we come back to good enough. Could you have more of them? And of course, Rolls struggled getting the, the Griffin out the door. Who knows? It's an inter it's interesting what if. And I don't think it would have changed it too much. I think you would have had a different aircraft, slightly lesser, I would have thought, because I don't think you'd be having, um, you know, three squadrons of crazy Canadians flying around with 2,000 pounds worth of bombs underneath the wings. It's an interesting what if. The 61 in a Tempest, uh, Griffin 61 in a Tempest, I think that would have been very tasty. That would have been a very clean aircraft. And when you look at the Tempest 2 with the radiator, um, the, the wing-mounted radiators, with that engine, because that's 2,000 odd horsepower, I think that would have been a really, really good aircraft. But there we go. Um, Adam Setchfield over on Twitter asks, why do you think there's just a single complete Tempest 5, Kermit Weeks has it, um, that survives and no others were preserved as gate guardians, etc., like Spitfires? A Spitfire looks good on a stick, as you know, monument people are trying to do at the moment. Um, but at the same time, it you know, the, the Tempest 5 and 6 and 2, uh, the 2s all ended up out in, in, in India and Pakistan. The, the 5s and 6s, mostly 6s, I think, ended up as target tugs. You're well into the jet age. The ones that survive are pretty knackered. A few did end up um, 
as Gate Guardians. I think they, they were then all scrapped. Again, we come back to Legacy of War. You know, pe people were moving on. They were wanting the future. They were wanting the promise that was given them during that time. And jets were cooler. You know, it's that there's not a historical mind at the time. You know, nowadays it's it's very much you know you you look what um, US Air Force have done with the um, F-117As. They've made sure all the surviving ones have gone to to museums. Um, check one out at Pima. It's a different mindset. In it's one of these things. Hindsight, you're like, well, we should have saved one of everything. Well, yeah, at the time they didn't care. They needed to be preparing for what they thought was the next war. Um, Matt Willis facetiously asked, what do you call a typhoon fan? I call them an exceptional human being, Matt. Any other business? Right, let's start wrapping this up. We've been going for far longer than I thought we would. Uh, Joe Wilding again. Um, what aviation book or documentary would you love to see made or remade with a fresh lens? Um, I don't know. Anything that offers a fresh um, research-based critical look at a subject. Um, more female narratives, more black and... Asian stories as well. I think those are massively underrepresented tales. It's why we had John on the other week to talk about it. It's been a while since I've, I struggled with this. I couldn't think of a documentary recently that I've watched that has kept me going. Um, is it Blue Cold, the, the remastered B-17 one? Yeah, that, that, that was cool. Not really a doc. But I think something that is that a production company wants to actually tell a story about and not half-ass it and do it on the cheap. And that's the problem. I think something really good would cost money, and I don't think there's money for it when all people want to do is tune in to watch how great Spitfires are. So I know it's a bit down. Um, book, I'd love to see a new book on Typhoon and Tempest. Uh, the stuff Chris Thomas has done is fantastic. The stuff Christopher Shores has done is, is wonderful. You know, I've spoken to Chris. He said he always wanted to update the Typhoon and Tempest story into two volumes to do a specific one on each aircraft. When he got the copyright back, I don't think that's going to happen. He's doing some interesting stuff with Wing Leader. I would love Matt Willis to take on Typhoon Tempest. I think the, his Mustang book and his books in general. I'm a big fan of his. That's why I keep having him back on the podcast. And because if I'm desperate, he will drop everything and come on. Um, uh, where are we? I'm looking up over here. So if if you're watching the YouTube version, you know, it's Mustang, the untold story, which is all about the early Allison engine aircraft. If you read that and then apply his brain to Hawkers, which he does, he won't admit it loudly but he does like hawkers i think he'd do an incredible job um filmy wise is, is clearly red tails which is why i'm so excited for masters of the air episode eight watch this space on that um jamie mctrusty on blue sky asked if there's one aircraft other than the typhoon that's given you'd like to see return to the skies what would it be any of the 1920s or 30s airliners um i made a list um uh, the Boeing 314, the Big Clipper, uh, the de Havilland Albatross, the HP-42, the Armstrong Whitworth Ensign, all those, um, the French Bloch, 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 um, MB-160, 161 Languedoc, those are cool, Boeing 307 Stratoliner, stuff like that. But top of that list would be the, the flying boats. I, I'd love to see a short C-class fly. Um, I think I saw the Sunderland Kermit Weeks got fly past it. Biggin Hill in the 90s. I don't really remember it. But it's flying boats that stick to my head. I'd love to see Supermarine Sea Line 2, someone recreate that, or Jimmy Doolittle's Curtis uh, R3C that he won the Snyder Cup in. Uh, that Marky M52, that would be epic. Warbirds wise, again, flying boats, you saw stuff like Supermarine Southampton. Um, a B36 or a B58 would be cool. What else have we got? I think that's come to the end of it. Oh, actually, we've got one more. And I go to WhatsApp for this one because this one's from my darling wife, Wendy. She asks, I have a podcast question. What is a good aviation book for people who do not know much about planes, but who would like to learn more? Now, I don't know, dear wife. And I told her this, so I'm going to put this out to you, dear listener. We've come to the end of the pod. What book would you recommend as a good general introduction to aviation? And who would you have to talk about it? Because I'd love to have them on. Because I've been struggling with this one for a while. Because it is a fantastic, fantastic question. What's the 
the sort of starter for 10 book that you would recommend to someone who wants to know more about flying, aviation, aerospace in general. So I'm going to leave that with you, dear listener and dear viewer, because I think that's a really interesting place to to go is this pod tends to delve into specific subjects for, you know, I've been rambling on for far too long, but what about generalists? Bring it in. I think, you know, uh, Ben's book about civil aviation was, was superb. So something, something like that, a, a good starter for 10, um, for that. maybe Roland White's flight book that he did a while ago. That might be a good one, but let me know, stick, stick some comments, send, send me a message and, um, we'll give it a shout out. Um, on a future pod and maybe do an episode on it and get my dear wife to join us. That'll be fun. Until then, um, thank you so much for indulging me. Thank you for letting my cyberpunk addiction push some of the, the pods back. We've got a couple lined up. I'm waiting to hear back on you know, TV show things, which are progressing. So I'll let you know more about that in the future. Check out 909 Apparel, link in the description below. Of course, our fantastic partners at the Pima Air and Space Museum. If you'd like to get involved in what we're going to do there, Patreon is going to be the place for that. So become a damn castier, just three quid a month plus the VAT. All that does is basically pay for all the, the apps and systems and microphones and, and things like that. So until next time, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for listening and do take care of yourselves. Bye bye. The Damcasters is hosted and produced by Matt Bow and is a Bony Abroad podcast production. To learn more about our podcasts and check out our previous episodes, head to www.thedamcasterspod.com.